All right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, everybody for attending today's uh, webinar on utilizing freeze-dry microscopy as part of a complete thermal characterization study for optimizing lyophilization and cycle development. Um, today, uh, we have a couple of presenters. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Jeff Schwegman. He's the founder and CEO of AB Biotechnologies. Jeff specializes in formulation development, lyophilization cycles, and thermal characterization studies, including freeze-dry microscopy and DSC. He's available for speaking engagements and consulting services on these topics that he's going to discuss today. Um, our other speaker that we have with us is Ruben Nieblas of Macron Microscopes and Accessories. Uh, for more than a decade, Ruben has installed microscope systems all over the world and specializes in the installation and use of Lincoln thermal equipment including uh, what he's going to talk about today, the uh, Lincoln SDCS196 freeze-dry system. Both Jeff and Ruben will field questions from the audience immediately following today's presentation. Uh, they're also developing a hands-on course on lyophilization, cycle development, and optimization uh, for to be offered later in the year at Hook College of Applied Sciences. If you're interested in uh, freeze-dry services or freeze-dry microscopy equipment, there will be a contact information slide provided at the end of this presentation. And uh, today's webinar will be available on the Macron Group website. It will be recorded, so you can reference that uh, at your leisure at a later date. And without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Jeff Schwegman. Okay, well, thank you, Chuck. And again, like Chuck said, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, this is just kind of a, um, a general overview of how we incorporate um, the free strain microscopy system as part of a complete thermal characterization. Now, uh, for those of you who maybe have been in uh, working in, in lyophilization for a number of years, um, you know, in earlier days, the, the method for optimizing a cycle was just pretty much open the door of the freeze dryer, put your product in, push a button, and hope at the end of the day you get something that, that at least works. And again, you may burn through 20 to 30 runs and um, a lot of product. Now, you know, within the past 20 years, maybe even 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot of new uh, technologies that have been developed that have, are putting the science in the freeze drying. It's not the trial, trial and error guesswork that, that we used to do. And one of those pieces of equipment that we use is the freeze dry microscopy system. So what we're going to do is kind of walk through um, over the next 15 minutes or so for my part, kind of talking to you about you know, why we would do the thermal characterization, why we would do the microscopy, and how it could really benefit us, not only in, in how we develop the cycle and optimize the cycle, but also down the road if we have problems with the cycle, how this is a, a really good tool set of tools for diagnosing and correcting failed cycles or failed products. Now when we talk about characterizing a system, basically what we're doing a couple of things. Number one, we're identifying what our sample is. Now when we freeze it, obviously the sample forms a solid. Um, but which type of solid it forms is extremely critical in how we design the cycle, both in primary and secondary drying, because the different phases that can form um, can behave and do behave very differently. So generally what happens is when we freeze a sample down, an aqueous sample, again, sometimes we may be working with co-solvents, but if we're working with an aqueous system and we start to freeze the sample, we're going to hit a certain temperature where we're going to get a phase change, meaning ice is going to start crystallizing out of our, out of our product. Now, this is pure ice. Everything else um, in that formulation, all your excipients, your active ingredient, any buffer salts, are going to be pushed around the ice crystals into what we call the interstitial space. Well, eventually, the solids or the, the other components in the interstitial space will solidify. And that's what is really key in what we're identifying through the uh, thermal characterization. So basically, we say there's generally two types of solids that we have form in that interstitial space. One would be a eutectic, and when I say eutectic, we need to be thinking about a crystalline system. Um, to contrast that, we may have an amorphous phase, which forms a glassy phase. So 
then we would be talking about a TG prime or a glass transition. And it's not uncommon for many of the complex formulations we work with these days to have a, a mixture of both. So let's kind of walk through here what goes on as we freeze a sample down. Obviously, we start in solution. And as we're going down, we're decreasing the temperature. Again, as I mentioned, finally we hit a temperature where ice will nucleate. Then we start to grow ice crystals. We do that at the expense of pulling the water out of the interstitial space where all the excipients and the active ingredient is located, super concentrating that phase. And again, again eventually we hit a uh, temperature and a concentration where we're going to form either a glassy phase or a crystalline uh, eutectic. Again, something may form a metastable glass or a lyotropic liquid crystal. Um, those are something we would get into more depth um, in the hands-on course. But for right now, mostly what we're dealing with are the stable glasses and the eutectics that form. Now, these are important because we know where ice melts. Ice is going to melt once you exceed zero degrees Celsius. But the interstitial space, whether it's got a eutectic uh, or a glassy phase, those are very different temperatures. Um, and again, uh, this is something that we're trying to identify through the use of these tools, including the freeze dry microscope. Now, we have to stay below these temperatures. If we exceed the eutectic melting temperature or the glass transition temperature, Tg prime, that interstitial space is going to be a fluid. Now, the problem is, in primary drying, the main goal is to remove the ice in the ice channels. Well, if the interstitial space is not a solid, it's not going to support its own weight, and it goes through a collapsing event. So essentially, you end up with a puddle of goo in the bottom of the vial. This is something we would use, utilize DSC to do. This is something, again, where the microscope comes into play. And these two systems. The DSC is the gold standard for the thermal analysis, and the microscope is the gold standard for collapse. These, these two instruments complement each other, and we'll, we'll discuss that in a little more detail as we go. So we have to stay below those critical temperatures. Again, these are important because these rep represent, for the most part, the warmest temperature we can go, that's product temperature, during primary drying without losing uh, you know, loss of structure of the product. And we don't, we obviously want to collapse product. So, I've got a little diagram here showing you, again, the se phase separation. These are the ice channels. And we like nice wide ice channels because they provide a good conduit to get the water vapor out of the product. Now here's the interstitial space. Now in this case, it's a crystalline solute, so it forms the eutectic. In this phase, it's a glassy phase, so it forms the, the glassy amorphous phase. Now, these two trap water very differently, so identification is key. Um, the crystalline phase, you may have. You know, for a completely crystalline system, your product at the end of primary drying is already 99.99% dry. For an amorphous phase, you know, you could still be retaining, you know, 40% of your moisture is still locked in this amorphous phase. So identification is key. Okay, well, we talked about that determines the maximum temperature that the product can withstand during primary drying without losing structure. Now, how do we do it? Well, there's a couple of different ways we can do it. These first four bullet points represent what we call thermal character, uh, uh, thermal analysis. Again, DSC is or modulated DSC is by far the gold standard, and we always couple that with a freeze dry microscopy experiment. So, thermal analysis for those of you who took physical chemistry, anytime there's a physical or chemical change that occurs in a material, it's going to give off or absorb a little heat from the environment, what we call exothermic or endothermic reaction. And again, that's what the DSC is picking up. Um, Again, differential scanning calorimetry, they also make a modulated version that we can use mostly for solid materials or, or materials that are very complex and maybe have overlapping thermal events. Um, so basically, we take our sample. Now, this would be just like um, we were going to take the liquid, put it in the freeze dryer. So everything's got to be the same. Um, so we take the liquid, put it in the uh, sample pan. We put an empty pan um, as the reference pan and, and cool these down and warm them up. Um, I'm not going to go too much into heat flow, but it's actually, in the essence, time here. But basically, it's um, looking at heat flow as a function of the heating rate, which we can control. And again, the DSC allows us to control uh, or understand the heat capacity of the different mechanisms that are going on. Uh, we'll skip that. OK, so here's the system here in our lab. Um, very simple system. Um, Basically, the lid pops off here. There's a sample furnace and a reference furnace. Um, we warm the samples, or we cool the samples down, so we start at room temperature. 
And there's two curves here. One's the warming curve and one's the cooling curve. So we cool the sample down, boom, we see crystallization occur. That's the ice freezing in the sample. We get down to a fixed temperature. In this case, it was about negative 65. And then we warm up and go through our melting events. Um, now, the melting, we don't look at the cooling curve, something called supercooling and freezing point depression, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this. But let's take a look at some of the warming curves that we see. They're very characteristic of what our product is. So if I see on the warming curve this very sharp peak, that tells me classic example of a eutectic melt. I've got a crystalline material in here. The temperature that we reference is what's called the onset. So it's a tangent drawn to the baseline, tangent to the front edge of the peak. And right about there is what we'd call the eutectic melting temperature. Glass transition's a little bit different. Um, tangent drawn here, tangent drawn here. The midpoint of that is what we represent as the glass transition temperature of our, of our product. Um, this is a good example. I mean, glass transitions are very low energy events, so we do have to go looking for them. If we ran a DSC, looked at the warming curve, and took this for face value, we'd say, well, there's a, a glass transition, or I'm sorry, a eutectic melt here. Our product is safe all the way up to about negative 5. Well, the problem is, buried in the background, there's a very low energy glass transition. And if we miss that, you know, we're going to be in trouble. Um, our sample would collapse. We've got to keep this at much lower temperatures. So this is where it, 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 it tends to be a little bit misleading, unless you know what you're looking for. Uh, OK, uh, some of these got added by mistake. Let's skip ahead a little bit. OK, uh, freeze dry microscopy. So we do the DSC. A sample comes in the lab. We do the DSC. It tells us, number one, what is the thermal event? Is it glass transition? Is it eutectic melt? And what are the critical temperatures that are associated with it? We then go to the microscope. And this, again, what this will tell us is where that sample physically loses structure. Now, just because we see a glass transition doesn't mean that's going to collapse the sample. Um, and again, a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but sometimes we may have a glass transition that occurs, and we see no collapse. So this is the beauty of, of using both the microscope and the DSC in that the microscope complements and supports the data we get from the DSC. So this is a, and Ruben will go through some of this in his part. So basically, we take the sample, put it on the microscope, freeze it down to about negative 45, and collect an image. We want to show an image of the frozen layer. Then we kick on the vacuum, and we start drying at a safe temperature. So the DSC says, you got a glass transition. I think in this case, it was uh, around negative. 37, 38. So we're probably drying this about negative 40 because we want to dry and get an intact dried layer. So this, this is the frozen layer. This is the dried layer, which is intact. And Ruben will talk about more. There's a, a magenta uh, filter in here. So if we see a magenta color coming through, we know we're starting to get collapse. This is the sublimation front, where that it's a razor thin line where we're actually converting the ice directly from a solid to a gas. Well, then once we collect this image, we're going to start warming this sample up because I want to force it into a state of collapse because it shows me that temperature where we physically start to lose structure. Now, there's two temperatures I'm, I'm going to be looking at. And there, I, I need to put another slide in here. But basically, as we move across here, this is a temperature gradient. We're slowly warming the sample. And right about here, we start to see these tiny little pores open up. And as we get warmer and warmer, we finally collapse the whole structure. This is what I would call the onset of collapse. Um, this is where we just start to go through the glass transition. Just on the edge of that glass transition, we get, um, again, what we would call partial collapse. And this may manifest itself in a, in a product. as pores opening up in the product, or even the product shrinking away from the side of the vial, you know, shrinking in, in on itself. And then finally, we had a temperature in this particular case. It was negative 36 degrees, where we totally lose the structure. Now, so I look at the DSC data. I look at the microscopy data. And we come up with what we call a critical temperature, where we can freeze dry the product safely, or where we actually lose the product. And then we back that temperature down a little bit to make sure we, we, you know, we're drying safely. So what have we learned from the thermal characterization? It tells us a couple of things. Is the system crystalline, amorphous? Or is it a mixture of the, of the two? Tells us the critical temperatures, or at least tells us the glass transition or the eutectic melting temperature. And then the microscopy, the freeze dry microscopy, tells us where that collapsing event occurs. Now, um, again, it, 
the system will also tell us if we have a metastable system and if we need to do a annealing step. We can actually do annealing with these systems, again, a little bit outside of the, the um, scope of this course. So thermal analysis studies with the DSC, the microscope, allow us to take an empirical or scientific approach to lyophilization cycle development. And again, I can't tell you how, how much time and effort these techniques have saved us. I mean, now instead of taking, you know, 15 to 20 runs in the, in the freeze dryer to get something that works, with this information I can go in and develop a fully optimized cycle in about three to four runs. Um, so again, huge time saver and money saver in, in regards to development. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Ruben, and he'll tell you a little bit more about the details of the system. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Ruben Nablus, and I'm with Chrome Microscopes and Accessories. And uh, in addition to Jeff's uh, presentation, I have a quick uh, introduction into the Lincoln FDCS-196 freeze-drying microscope system. So as, just to reiterate what uh, Jeff had mentioned, uh, how we characterize our formulations, we characterize our formulations by using the following instruments, the DSC and the freeze-dry microscope. And the information that the DSC gives us is eutectic temperature and glass transition temperature. The information that the FDM gives us is the actual collapse temperature of our product. The, one of the main things is that the glass transition uh, can be anywhere between 5 to 15 degrees different than our actual collapse temperature. And as if we are able to freeze dry warmer, we exponentially increase the rate of drying of our product. So if we're actually able to freeze dry our product at minus 25, instead of, say, a glass transition at minus 34, we're giving it less energy, so it's costing us less to produce, uh, and it'll uh, freeze dry uh, a lot quicker. So again, thermal analysis studies tells us if the system is amorphous, crystalline, or partially crystalline, tells us our critical temperatures, and it also tells us if we need to anneal the system approximately what those conditions are. So this is an image of the complete system, and I'm going to go over the different components that are on here. So the first is, just like with any freeze-drying system, we need a vacuum pump for the sublimation process. This is the system that is provided, a BOC Edwards 1.5 pump. Next, we actually have a motorized valve on the system. This actually controls the pressure inside of the actual stage itself. Via the software, we can actually regulate the pressure inside just like you do on a standard um, pilot scale and or production scale freeze dryer. Next, we have a two liter doer that comes with the system. The system uh, only uses liquid nitrogen. You cannot use any other type of coolant. Another uh, question that always comes up with, uh, with this system is, how long would that uh, two liter doer last? Uh, depending upon your uh, routine, uh, it can last anywhere between six to eight hours conservatively. It could last longer, it could last shorter, depending again how low you're going, how fast, uh, and other conditions. Next, all of our systems are provided with a polarized light microscope. On a polarized light microscope, we have a polarizing condenser, we have an analyzer, a first order red compensator, the objectives, and your camera. So on the microscope, we have our condenser at the bottom. Next we have, which has the polarizer on it. Next we have our analyzer up on the top. We will have a first order red compensator. We have our objectives. On the condensers, there's a special lens that needs to be added onto it. This is a long working distance extension lens. This is needed because our sample is higher up inside of this stage. Um, and so therefore, to properly align the microscope, this extension net lens needs to be added onto the condenser so we can make sure that our microscope is aligned properly. Like any other analytical piece of equipment, a microscope cannot be calibrated. However, it needs to be make sure that it is aligned properly so all the light possible is going through our sample so we can resolve as much as we can. Next, we have our analyzer. And our analyzer is the same uh, material as a polarizer, except we have to be able to distinguish one from the other. So the one that the light passes through first is always known as our polarizer. The one that the light passes through after our sample is always known as our analyzer. Our first order red compensator is used uh, in the system because we're using the polarized light uh, accessories as uh, qualitative, not quantitative. 
We're not trying to measure the birefringence of the material that we have, but as just mentioned, we're using the colors that uh, come up so that we can easily see where that uh, onset of collapse and also collapse starts. Everything is visual when we come with the freeze-drying microscope. Again, we have uh, our different objectives on here. So the objectives uh, must have a working distance of greater than 4.5 millimeters. Systems that we provide are a Nikon polarized light system, which include a 5x, 10x, 20x, and 50x objectives. Uh, Linkum has also written their software to only work with the Q imaging line of digital cameras. And the one that we recommend is the QICAM Fast. Going on with the Linkum stage, this is the Linkum SCCS 196 stage. So therefore, here we have our vacuum ports, we have our X manipulator, we have a Y manipulator, so we can move our sample in any direction. We have our sample door lock. Once I remove the lid, we have a 22 millimeter silver block. We have a 1.3 millimeter light aperture. We have a liquid nitrogen inlet, liquid nitrogen outlet. We have our platinum resistor leads, and we have our thermocouple leads and our sample round. The way that the Lincoln system works, you have to think about it like a tug of war. The controllers here, oops, I'm sorry, I'm back here. Uh, the controllers, what it does is it'll cre uh, it will send an electrical current through the platinum resistor um, with whatever temperature it is that you've told it to. So in our case, we're going down in cooling. So therefore, then, the controller will also activate the LMP95, which is a liquid nitrogen pump. Therefore, the system knows how much the pump needs to regulate or suck through a liquid nitrogen, and then the platinum resistor will create the heat going through onto the block. Below that silver block, there is a coil, and then there's channels. And so therefore, as the flow of liquid nitrogen comes through, and the electrical current goes in through the platinum resistor, it is accurately controlled for the rate that you want to heat or cool. So therefore, if you want to go down 10 degrees per minute, it will regulate that flow and that current on that platinum resistor to 10 degrees per minute or 5 degrees per minute. This system can go as slow as 0 0.05 degrees per minute or as fast as 150 degrees per minute in the heating and cooling. And the highest temperature that it will reach is 125 degrees and as low as negative 196. Next, we have our Pirani gauge. Our Pirani gauge is what's actually reading the pressure inside of the stage. And this is what's giving the readout to the software and also that uh, motorized valve that I had previously sh uh, shown you so that we can control the pressure inside of the stage. Next we have our controllers. We have a T95 controller, we have the LNP controller, and we have the link pad. Here's a closer look. So again, the T95 is the brains of the system. It will tell the system uh, how much of the electrical current going through uh, the block, the liquid nitrogen pump is also controlled via the uh, T95 controller, and that will regulate the amount of flow of liquid nitrogen to go through the block itself. And the link pad is an actual digital display. Next, of course, we have we need a computer to run the entire system. So with that, these are the specifications for the computer. It must be a Windows 32-bit. It can also now be a Windows 64-bit operating system. It must have an available serial port, uh, an available PCIe Express card so that we can introduce the uh, FireWire card for the camera. Uh, these are the specifications of the processor, how much RAM, uh, minimum requirements. These are some of the accessories that are needed or that are used with the Lincoln freeze drying system. First, we have the G16.3 sample holder, or what I call the lollipop. Next, we have a silicon oil. We have a 16 millimeter quartz window. And then we have a glass cover slip that we would use. The way that you would sample load is you would first introduce the sample holder into the stage. We will then place a single drop of silicon oil onto the block inside of the, of the uh, ring. Once we place our 16 millimeter quartz window, which is our substrate, 
what happens is that the oil fills in underneath that 16 millimeter quartz window, and therefore you have even thermal contact from the block onto the substrate. So in case there's any imperfections on the quartz cover slip, or if there's any micro scratches on the block, all of that gets filled in with the oil so you have that uh, even thermal contact. We'll place only three to five microliters of sample, that is all that you need, uh, onto, on top of the 16 millimeter quartz window, and then we would place this 9 millimeter or 13 millimeter glass cover slip on top of our sample. And then we would actually freeze dry then from the outer edge of the cover slip into the center. This is an accessory that is, uh, comes with the system. It's uh, the vacuum tweezers. This uh, makes uh, sample loading, uh, especially with those 9 and 13 millimeter glass cover slips, uh, very easy to do. So this is the actual view of the software itself. Again, very simple to navigate through. On the top, we have our temperature control box. Next, we have our uh, camera control box. We'll have our vacuum control. We have a live digital window preview. And just like in any freeze dryer, we have our profile window, which we will be able to tell the rate, limit, time, and delay. The rate, of course, is how fast we need to heat and cool our sample. The limit is up to what temperature do you want to reach during that ramp. The time is once it reaches that limit temperature, how long do you want to hold it there before it moves on to the next ramp? And finally is the delay. The delay allows us to capture an image in whatever interval number you uh, input it in there. Uh, the nice thing about this is, is that at the beginning of the experiment, nothing's really happening. However, we want to uh, document what's going on from the beginning of the experiment through the end, so we can actually regulate the amount of image capture uh, going through our experiment so that we're not creating so large of uh, image format that, uh, you know, it's going to be overwhelming for your uh, IT department and your network. Once the experiment is done, the data chart is, uh, uh, once you save all of the, uh, the run, uh, the data chart gives you a graphical interpretation of your temperature profile. It also tells you the uh, pressure uh, that was recorded during the experiment. And each one of those purple dots is an actual image that was captured during that experiment. When you click on, we can actually view all the images in the gallery view, and they're titled by the, in, by the temperature that they were captured at. Once you've chosen an image, we can now uh, have the image with all of the temperature information placed on the bottom of the image. Onto it, you can also add any type of description uh, onto here, such as lot number, experiment number, so on and so forth. And once all of these uh, images are captured, we can also, within the system, grab all of those images and create an AVI, or time-lapse video, of the entire experiment. So something that could have taken us two, three, maybe four hours uh, in, the, in that experiment, we can condense down and view uh, within 30 seconds or less than a minute. Uh, I want to say thank you for uh, coming to our webinar. I'll throw it back to uh, Chuck for any final thoughts. Yeah, this is, uh, thanks Ruben. This is the uh, contact information for uh, Jeff and Ruben uh, for today's webinar. If you have any questions, um, Feel free to, to contact uh, either one of these guys, or uh, we do have a few minutes here. If you'd like to uh, type in a question, we would be uh, happy to answer. We'll just uh, wait for a minute here, see if anybody has any questions. It looks like um, looks like we've got a question here. Does vacuum set point impact the critical temperature? Collapse. Collapse temperature. Jeff, would you like to answer that? 
Yeah, can you read that again? I'm not seeing these pop up. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, does vacuum set point impact uh, the TC results? Oh, uh, well, no, it won't, it won't affect the glass transition temperature. It will affect um, product temperature. So this is why if we're, um, say, drying at a fixed temperature in the freeze dryer and we start to fluctuate pressure, we can, we can actually see product temperature change. And in that case, you may exceed your critical temperature, whether that be a glass transition or your tectic melt. Um, so it won't necessarily affect the the TG prime, it will affect product temperature, which could exceed the, the TG prime during drying. Okay, next question is, does it only work with water-based solutions? Uh, no, we can actually, we do uh, quite a few that are, sometimes they're solvent-based um, systems as well. I mean, you could do, I mean, a lot of the diagnostic folks and some of the tissue folks that are freeze-drying those products use some really odd odd solvents. So no, it applies to it applies to everything. How do you differentiate T G and T G prime? Okay, yeah, that's that's a good question. So basically there's there's only one T G prime. So a product, you mix it up, it's in its final formulation, you freeze it down. If there's an amorphous component, that amorphous phase has a fixed temperature where it will go through its glass transition from a you know a liquid or a solid to a liquid, and it's got a fixed water content. Now the water is acting as a plasticizer, so it does affect that temperature. But when you first freeze a sample down, it's got a fixed water content and a fixed temperature. That's TG prime. There's only one TG prime for a formulation. Now as we dry the product, we're starting to pull water out of that interstitial space, and as we do, again, the temperature we can take that before it collapses increases. So there's one TG prime, but many TG values as we pull out the moisture. Um, the end of the day, when we finish freeze drying, we hope that we've pulled out enough moisture that the TG of the final product is, is higher than room temperature, obviously. Okay. Um, Does running primary drying at different temperatures affect collapse temperature? Well, it won't affect the collapse temperature. I mean, the 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 collapse temperature is pretty much going to be consistent regardless of you know what temperature you run or what pressure you run. Now, that that's not to say that you can't start varying these and and not lose your product. I mean, there's there's various combinations of uh, shelf temperature and chamber pressure that we can change and still keep product temperature the same. Now this is something too, again, that was beyond the webinar, but we go into more detail in the, in the, in the course about how we understand those and determine those. So it won't affect where that critical temperature occurs, but product temperature is affected by both chamber pressure and shelf temperature and understanding and controlling those is critical or you might exceed the glass transition or critical temperature of your product. Hey, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Um, how can we how can we correlate the DSC and FDM data to anneal the system when is needed? Well, one of the when you when you run the DSC, you can actually see uh, an amorphous phase or a metastable phase forming, um, and we can actually conduct annealing studies both on the DSC and the microscope. So if we have a metastable system, the DSC and the microscope allow us to identify, is it a metastable system? Where do we need to anneal it? Um, you know, does We can actually do annealing on, on both of them. It was the annealing effective? And then um, you know, use that in, in cycle development. So it's a great tool for that as well. OK, and then one more here. Uh, can this instrument quantify the size of ice crystals under different temperature, and how sensitive is it? I'll, I'll leave that one to you, Ruben. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, you can measure the ice crystals um, that are formed uh, on here with, uh, you know, you can do simple point-to-point -point measurements of the ice crystal um, under different temperatures, uh, how sensitive, sensitive it is is going to be dependent upon what magnification you're at to basically increase the size of those ice crystals for you to measure. 
um, how that is going to actually affect the collapse temperature of it. Uh, I, it I don't believe that it does. Uh, it's just the, the form of the ice crystals that are being formed. Uh, if you want to expand or make your ice crystals even larger, uh, one of the things that you can do is actually do an annealing step where you're bas basically partially melting those ice crystals and then having them reform as a larger crystal. That would be more for your pilot scale and your production scale to, if you can increase that uh, ice uh, size, Again, when you're trying to freeze dry it out, you've got a larger channel where that uh, sublimation process can uh, occur. Do you have anything else to add on that, Jeff? No, I think, I, no, Ruben's right. It won't change your critical temperature, but it can, the ice crystal size can change how it, how it freezes. Or, I'm sorry, how it dries. Again, like you said, the smaller the ice crystal, it's going to tend to dry um, slower. It's going to be a little bit warmer, uh, more resistance, trying to get the water out through those tiny pores versus larger ice crystals. But yeah, you can measure that. We've done it in our lab with, with our microscopy system, and it's, it's pretty much a point and click uh, uh, measurement, so very easy. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll uh, end it up with one more. Can you differentiate the collapse and irregular ice structure? Well, when you're, when you're seeing the, you know, live as it's being freeze dried, once you've reached that collapse temperature, uh, on an amorphous, you're not going to have any more ice structure. It's going to actually go ahead and collapse. Uh, on the, some of the images that uh, Jeff showed, um, you'll see that you know there was basically that black uh, black line, which is your sublimation front. Once it started collapsing, there's no more uh, material left behind the 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 uh, sublimation front. Yeah. Now the ice, the, the frozen phase would still be intact because you may have exceeded a glass transition temperature, but we're still below the freezing temperature of ice. So you'll still see that frozen layer remain intact because we still have ice crystals that are helping to support the system. But, but Ruben's right. So anything behind that where we're actually freeze drying, that's where we're going to see full collapse once we exceed the glass transition temperature. OK. Oh, we've got one more here. Um, what is your explanation for product primary drying at a certain temperature? but they don't create a freeze-dry front on the SDM at the same temperature? Um, well, I mean, again, this is going to vary a little bit with, um, you know, temperature you run and, uh, again, total solids. I mean, we've had, we've had to set up our microscopy system. So, for example, we got a sample that had very uh, total solids content, a very high total solid content, and the temperature was relatively low. We were running at about negative 37. Well, in that case, I mean, it's just going to, there's huge resistance to get the water vapor out, not to mention you're running it cold, so the vapor pressure or sublimation rate is going to be very low. Now, in those cases, we set the system up, turned it on, and walked away from it for several hours, and then come back, and then we'll, and then we'll, we'll finally see the sublimation front, so that, that rate um, in some instances, is going to be very low, and you may have to set that system up and, and walk away from it. Um, but that, then, then again, that is a good indication that when you try to put this stuff in a vial, it's going to take forever to freeze dry. So th those are, I mean, you can um, get a little information about how your product's going to behave in a freeze dryer but what, by what you see occurring under the microscope. Okay. Well, I think that's it. We have some great uh, questions. Appreciate everyone's uh, input on that. And I'd like to again thank uh, Jeff and Ruben for putting on a wonderful webinar today on uh, freeze drying. And uh, if you have any questions for either Jeff or Ruben, again, their uh, their contact information is up here on the slide. We'll have this webinar archived on uh, the Macron Group website shortly. And uh, we will be sending out announcements uh, for the new course that they will be teaching uh, later this year at Cook College of Applied Sciences. And uh, I'd just like to thank you both again for uh, a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.